Hello, my name is Charles Bedord. Ever wonder what it's like to run a small business in Silicon Valley? Well, stay tuned and find out some of the challenges faced by small business owners and their employees. Small business owners and their employees must overcome several distinct challenges to be successful in Silicon Valley. To talk about these issues, our guest today is Mr. Kirk Barton, the founder and general manager of A Slice of New York, a pizza business with stores located in Santa Clara and Sunnyvale. Kirk, welcome to The Better Part. Thanks, Jeff. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you entered the pizza business. Uh, well, so I have a tech career that I started in, in Manhattan where I grew up. When I came out to Cisco in San Jose back in the late 90s, one of the things that I always do whenever I travel, you look for your pizza shop, Chinese place, sandwich shop. <laughs> and in New York, San, uh, pizza was one of those things that I, it's kind of like my comfort food. Mm -hmm. I never found something that I really, uh, truly bonded with. Uh, so it's always been on my mind since I moved out to California. So that was your passion. That was my passion. <laughs> Still always my passion. Always a consumer. Always a consumer. So as a restaurant founder, uh, how do you go about making a good dining or entertainment experience available to people in this area? People especially who don't have high-paying tech jobs. Uh, to me, it's one of the things that, one of the corporate things that I really took to heart is it's all about people. So when I was in NBC, GE, um, Jack Welch always talked about uh, it's all about the people and the culture. Cisco, same way. John Chambers, same thing. All about the people. And so we brought, kind of brought that to uh, the retail business. I've never worked in retail before. I've never worked in a restaurant before. So when I told my mom Really? That, You'd never worked in a never, restaurant? Never worked in a restaurant. <laughs> so when, my, when I told my mom that I was thinking about a pizza shop, uh, she said, uh, are you crazy? What are you doing? You don't know anything about that industry. Uh, you know how many times they fail. Mm -hmm. um, in New York, they close all the time. Yes. Um, but that's something that was a passion of mine because I didn't find that here. There's a lot of displaced New Yorkers, a lot of right, there are, yeah. um out here, a lot of East Coasters out here. Um, and I saw it as something that is, is needed, is needed in, mm -hmm. in this area. So what advice would you give to anyone thinking about opening a small business? Be very clear on what you're trying to accomplish and, 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 and focus on that. And no matter how many times you try and communicate that to someone else, they're never really going to understand what drives you and what your passion is, whether it's your spouse, your friends, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you're well-funded. Make sure there's plenty of money yes. uh, to do that. And then when you start, you know, keep your foot on the gas and keep going. Don't, don't, don't stop and believe in yourself and what you have in, in, your, in your mind. And uh, pizza was your passion growing up? Always. <laughs> it's, just what I, it's what I do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you ever nuke leftover pizza for yourself? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, cardinal rule here, do not do that. We actually have on our FAQ page on our website, do not microwave our product, period. <laughs> okay. It loses its taste, I think. It just it destroys yeah. it. Yeah. So what are the biggest challenges to overcome if you want a, your small business to be successful in this kind of an environment? So um, I'm, you know, they always talk about location, location, location. I'm, I'm, I don't actually buy into that. Really? It's more about the people uh, and, uh -huh. and gathering the right, the right team and assembling that. Uh, that to me is the most important thing is to, is to get the right people on board. You have to have people that are going to be uh, part of your organization that believe in what you're doing, that um, are on board with what your, what your goals are. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Do you think that you can train people to be part of the organization and become, become part of what's ongoing or do you think they just have that when they walk in the door? Well, there are certain things. So we don't expect any experience. We, right. we train, we're, we're happy to train anybody for anything. Uh -huh. uh, what we need is good attitude. You have to have a willingness to learn, willing to participate, and have just a, a passion for being and, and taking care of people. We're a service mm -hmm. industry. We take care of people. We, we create mm -hmm. fun. Um, and that's really, being, being willing to do that every day is something that not everybody can do. And we, we hold the bar kind of high at our place. Now, one of the things we hear a lot about these days, especially in restaurants, is the effect of minimum wage. We've been hearing how minimum wages have been uh, increased in the uh, Bay Area and other cities around the country. 
Uh, as a small business founder, what do you think about these minimum wage increases? Can most businesses afford to pay them? So I think that's going to be a challenge for most businesses, especially in the, in the, in the fast food. We don't consider ourselves fast food. We're a quick serve because um, right. nothing we do is fast. It just happens to be quick. Um, everything we do is made by hand. So we're a heavy labor-oriented product. Mm -hmm. our, our business is, is we have a lot of labor. We're almost 45% of our actual expense is just people, just labor. I see. So when we talk about, I don't like government messing in, in the way I run my business. Right. It, it takes away my tools. My tools are be able to bonus people, be able to take care of people. Um, and when I have mandates that say I need to start somebody off who's 17 years old, never had a job before, and have them have the same uh, pay structure that's similar to somebody that's been there maybe three years or four right. years, um, that's, that's a challenge for me. And okay. I, I just don't like that kind of control. But I, I'm su full supporter of minimum wage. I was supporter right. of the 15, um, right. you know, 18 to 15, all that. And, and I, you know, we should talk about living wage, not, not minimum wage. Right. Minimum wage is, is, yeah. is, a, is a fallacy. But as you, you know, used another interesting term there, bonuses. Do you believe in, you believe in the bonus concept? Yeah, yes. so absolutely. We, yes. we, we actually, that's some of the corporate stuff that we like. So with bonuses, right. we do annual bonuses. We've been proud to do uh -huh. annual bonuses every year. Uh -huh. Some people have never even ha heard of a bonus. <laughs> never had a bonus before until we actually did that. We do annual performance reviews uh, based on personal performance and business performance. Oh, that's great. And we take that. So we, 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 people need to understand where the business is and where it's coming from. There's no magic here. Mm -hmm. and it's all, it's finances. Business mm -hmm. is business where you're doing pizza, computers, phones. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all fundamentally the same function mm -hmm. as a business. It's how you make that business operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the other half that you hear about uh, besides uh, 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 minimum wage is rising rents. And uh, how do you adjust for rent increases? We hear a lot about businesses going out of business because the property owners have increased the rents. Uh, how do you adjust for that? And do you, how do you deal with that? So, in general, Rents go up every year. Um, we have fixed rate increases in, in our rents. All utilities go up. Um, there's only a couple of knobs you can turn to increase revenue in, in a business. You can increase volume as long as you're profitable. You can lower expenses, which is either cutting food quality, which right. we would never do, or you cut your labor or in, in some, somehow affect your labor costs, which are a large portion, or you raise your prices. Uh, those are the only three real knobs that you can turn. Two of them are, are for what I can see broken, we would never touch them, quality and people, um, which leaves price increase. The only way to handle that is through the menu um, so that it feeds from the customers into our, into our process so we can raise wages so people can afford to live here and we can afford to pay our bills. Now, uh, with the uh, increases, let's say, in minimum wage and in, like you, you've already addressed rents now, do you ever see a time in the future where Perhaps small businesses just can't function in this environment and will wind up with only corp large corporate businesses rather than private businesses. For instance, I know there are restaurants who have complained that uh, uh, company, large companies are opening their own cafeterias and their own eating facilities and drawing away nice business from too. them. And they subsidize it. Is this a real threat to small businesses? Do you see so, that? Yeah, so I don't think that's the threat necessarily, the, the, the campus uh, products. Uh, it's just the cost of living for people and being able for people to survive here. That's really at risk. When you look at uh, corporate companies like Pyology, that's a corporate chain out of business in the Bay Area. They close all their shops. Or you look at, um, you know, corporations like Starbucks or Applebee's or any of these other ones. If, when those become the, the, the norm and the small ones are going out of business because they're the only ones that can survive, I said that's going to be a real problem for me from a uh, quality of life perspective because people like the, the mom and pop shops are what create the, that really cultural bond. They're the ones that really, uh, they're not the only ones, but mm -hmm. they're the ones that typically are the fabric of the, of, of the foundation of the community that's, that's there. They're rooted in the community, they live in the community, and they support the community there. So it would be a real shame, and you're starting to see that, unfortunately, at Togo's in our shopping center, closed already. Um, by the bucket down on Stevens Creek, mm -hmm. closed. You're gonna see more and more, and, and it's slowly eroding that, that quality that exists here in, in the Bay Area. Do you find it difficult to hire uh, workers to uh, in uh, small businesses in Silicon Valley? Uh, for instance, in your own uh, pizza business, is it difficult to hire people? And if so, why is that? Uh, it's it's very challenging because the people that we tend to hire don't live here, I see. Uh, and they can't live here. They can't afford to live here when rents are twenty four hundred dollars a month for right. one bedroom. Um, 
you know, we, we don't pay minimum, but it's, it's nothing near the six-figure salaries that tech, so we're continually competing with just that as a general uh, way of life around now here. Now, when you say don't live here, you mean, well, where is here, for instance? They, they don't live in the Santa Clara Valley, or they don't? Uh, live in the uh, Sunnyvale particular or Santa Clara particular? So you can live in the valley and still not be able to get to work. Like I have right. a number of folks that live in South San Jose that cannot take public transit after a certain, certain hour because the buses don't run or the buses That's run so infrequently. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, people live, you don't have to live in, you know, I have people that live in Modesto, Gilroy, Morgan Hill, uh, Oakland that come in here and it makes me it hurts me to support that type of commute for our business mm -hmm. because I don't think that's scalable mm -hmm. um, but it, th this is the life we mm -hmm. live right now the people cannot afford to live mm -hmm. in the local commutable area they can't bike they can't walk because there's no no place around here that's affordable for them who are the typical applicants for jobs at small businesses not not in speaking your own uh, pizza business, but also if you have a broader perspective too, please, I'd like to hear about sure. that. Sure. Um, so in our business, we have uh, anything from, we start off, we don't like to go below 17 because we have uh, some heavy equipment right. in there. But at 17, uh, we have people that go up into, well, I'm, 50 so <laughs> so they go up to there and they're everything in between and we have everything from first-time entries into the workforce um, to uh, seasoned professionals working kitchen people that have culinary experience or want to get mm -hmm. into culinary experience or people that just want a change of pace we have a couple high-tech folks that are no longer in high-tech similar to me that are now uh, in our in our organization mm -hmm. Um, we have a different model, which I don't know if we'll get into, but it, we're, we're the first worker cooperative here in the South really? Bay. Um, so we actually have an employee-owned structure, legal structure, that we've created to help support and create um, really a career here rather than just a, a landing point mm -hmm. to jump off to some other, uh, some other job. So when you're reviewing uh, uh, CVs or resumes, uh, looking to hire someone, what jumps out uh, that makes an applicant, uh, say, very desirable or undesirable to work at a small business? Uh, so you're always the classic, if you bounce around, you see like six things in less than a year. That's, you got to ask, why is that? Um, okay. So, you know, that, frequent that's a, job change. Frequent job change. And I, I'm less concerned about past experience and what people have done in the past. I want a good attitude. My priority in hiring is culture. Because if you can't, you can't teach culture. You can't teach um, work ethic. That's inherent. And if those right. things aren't fundamentally there, that's not going to work out for us. We hold our our guys to a pretty high high standard, uh, a high level of excellence. We don't expect perfection. We don't want perfection. We just want a good attitude that tries hard, learns, and continues to so excel. At attitude rules and willingness to learn. Those are our priorities. The rest of the stuff you'll learn. But okay. if you don't have a good attitude, or you know, I would rather have someone with a great attitude with no experience than someone like a like a like a pro that has a lousy attitude mm -hmm. and bring the rest of the crew down. Yeah. Can you tell me about what percentage of uh, job applicants that you get live in the Santa Clara Valley? Uh, so we, we have a fair amount that live actually in the Valley, um, but just about everybody drives. Really? Uh, we have, I think, four people that use public transit out of about 35. Really? Um, okay. But that puts a lot of cars on the road. Uh, right now, and it's it's not a scalable solution right now. But they cannot afford. First of all, if there is something available, which there is very little available, it's so out. You know, all of their take-home pay would go just to pay rent. That's not scalable. Right. I mean, we pay pretty good. If you work full time with us, you can make fifty, sixty grand. I mean, that's 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 a reasonable expectation. Right. If you work full time with us, that can't even get you a starter rental place in a two bedroom. It's just it's it's a non-starter here, and it's a real problem. So essentially, they live far enough away so the buses and trains don't go there. Or they go there so infrequently or with the reconfiguration that VTA is doing, um, they're going to go there less or they'll eliminate routes altogether because they're not used that often. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us, you know, uh, right now, for instance, we have a lot of uh, conversation going on in the area about growth and no growth and so on. As a, from a perspective of a small business founder and general manager, are there some attitudes or actions that you see that are really de detrimental to small business growth and uh, development? I, I think part of it is just the general um, attitude that people that have been here for a while, um, uh, homeowners that have been here for a while, they don't want to see change to what they bought into a long time ago. And I think that's really hard because in order to embrace the people that are here today, there needs to be change. 
and I would be more scared to not see change than to see the change because right now what we have now uh, in our communities right now is 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 not functioning well um, heavy congestion inability to get to work on time or just not being willing to even make that commute like we'll have people that just will not they, it just won't work out for them because their their commute their commutes too long and they can't afford to live in the area so I think it's that's a real a real problem for me as a small business owner when people ask customers love us they say so when are you going to open up here or in San Francisco or in Fremont or in South mm -hmm. San Jose I'm like I want to maintain and, and make our current shops excellent and keep them excellent. I don't want to try and spread ourselves thin. I'm having I'm struggling staffing current current mm -hmm. levels right now. Do you think that let's say additional high density housing things like this would help? Or, uh, or I, I, I think it'll 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 definitely help. I think it'll definitely help as long as that high density housing um, also has considerations for everybody, not just the wealthy, and not just a certain demographic. Uh, but without without more capacity and more stock and more stuff for people to live in, it's this isn't going to change and it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about let's say the have you had some firsthand experience with people that have worked for you perhaps presently or past, and with uh, poor living conditions or uh, living living problems. So I'll, I'll use one example. We had a couple. We're, our, our guys are friends in and out of work. We have a very f right. familial um, environment. You know, we call it chosen family. We're a chosen family here because we do really. Um, the culture really bonds us together. And we had one guy that actually moved back to uh, Minnesota because his roommate, who also works here, he found another place that he moved out back home um, out in Tracy. He went home to Minnesota because he couldn't find a place to live that was affordable. He actually left the state. Mm -hmm. That's just one example. Another one down in Gilroy, again, another one in Morgan Hill. Uh, Oakland moved in, back in with their parents up in Oakland because he couldn't find local local work down here or a local place to live down here. Um, and for a while, he's, he's, he's commuting to us, which is, again, I don't feel, I love the guy. And I, yeah. I just, it hurts me to see him put himself through that kind of uh, condition to get to work. So transportation, you see, is is a real problem too. Uh, getting uh, people for, for for hiring people. Uh, do you have any suggestions on trans? Uh, could you talk a little bit about the transportation problem as far as uh, driving versus public transit, and uh, a little bit about let's say how this affects hiring people? Well, one one example I'll say like we, we're open till midnight. We're open till midnight um, in in our in our San Jose Santa Clara location on Siemens Creek. There are people that cannot get home because they don't have a car and they have to Uber or Lyft. Oh, really? So, yeah. so, so that, but that, that, that costs upwards of 15 to 20 bucks just to get home, right? That's an hour's worth of labor right there just to just to get from work to home. That's that that that's that's a real problem. Um, if we don't collectively as a community, it's not just the developers, it's not just city leaders, it's not just the community. If we all don't see this as a, as a, as a, as a crisis, not something we need to fix in five years, but something that we had to take immediate action on, I, I, we're going to lose our businesses. But on the other hand, it takes a long time to build infrastructure, doesn't it? For government, it does, yes. not for the private sector. <laughs> right? You got Apple, Google, all these people. We have all this technology being developed all over the place, and it's not being deployed here in our communities right now. I don't know why. I don't know why the first autonomous taxi was in, in Pennsylvania and not in San Jose mm -hmm. or not in Silicon Valley somewhere, uh, you know, commercially deployed. It makes, it makes me crazy to see all this technology around us because I think technology is how we will get out of this problem using, you know, that kind of leverage that technology right. gives us. Uh, but we need to embrace that and not be scared about that and be, be willing to take risk or we will, we will just be, you know, not doing something is still doing something. It's, it's a decision. Are you optimistic or somewhat pessimistic about solving transportation problems over the short and long term? Uh, I'm very optimistic, actually, okay. because uh, in, it, I think we have about 12 months to figure it out or we're going to hit a cliff. 12 months isn't very long. <laughs> no, no, it's not. But you know what? Companies come and go in those same timelines. They get, they, they, they've been established. Uh, and if... I, I, the reason I say that is, is a, as a kind of like a short fuse is because if we don't figure it out in that timeline, we will not have people that can support the small businesses that make our mm -hmm. communities wonderful. And they will slowly disintegrate. They will slowly disappear. They'll just close their doors. They'll shutter them just because they can't afford staff. It's mm -hmm. just not worth it anymore. 
Do you think that the challenges faced by your business are is very similar or somewhat different from challenges faced by other small businesses, such as, uh, let's say, fabric stores or uh, hobby shops or uh, barber shops, et cetera? Uh, so, I, yeah, so I don't know about, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to stick to the food industry a little bit right. because that's my where I'm more familiar right. with lately. Um, I think it affects everybody, but specifically in the food industry, we're not trying to create ro robots to do jobs. Like, we're not, when we integrate somebody into our environment, they become an integral part of our team, and we want them to be that way. So if they leave us, we feel it, and it hurts us because we believe that's how we can scale our business and have a real uh, meaningful business that people want to, that people respect and people want to be a part of. But uh, the labor issues and the kind of the ones where you're just doing the job, I'm just working my six, seven hours, I'm punching in, punching out, I'm really, I don't, you know, I'm just doing X, Y, or Z. Yeah. That I think is going to be a real struggle because there's no passion in, in necessarily in that work. It's just a it's just a paycheck, and that paycheck isn't enough to to cover to cover what's going on. I think it's a, it's it's going to be continue to be mm -hmm. a real problem. How do the cities of Santa Clara and Sunnyvale support small businesses? You you hear a lot, for instance, on the news uh, once in a while. There's a, a small business appreciation day, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, is there something that the uh, cities around here do do well to support small businesses? I don't see it very much, honestly. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have nothing against them. Uh, they're not hurting us, I don't think, but they're not doing anything to really support us. I mean, everybody likes to talk about they support small business, but I don't know how, what that translates to. Um, do you need special, I, I, I'm not a, I don't know, I'm not an expert on tax structures or uh, uh, rent or anything like this, but are, do they have any uh, programs aimed at uh, uh, money issues, such as tax or rents or anything? Not, not that, that I know. Uh, not that I know. Help of. support small businesses. <laughs> not, not that I know. All the big. <laughs> we're here for small business. We want to support you. I've never seen any of that. I've been in business almost 12 years right right now. Two two locations, um, and doing business with the cities in Santa Clara and Sunnyvale. Are wonderful. They're easy to get permits. It's very straightforward. That's fine. So from that perspective, okay, so from the it's permit, from, yeah. from getting open is great. Once you're open, though, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any inherent, you know, here's a here's a big pot of money you can go after. Now, one of the things in Santa Clara, we we're headquartered in Santa Clara, and like I said, we're we're a worker cooperative now, and I think they they like that idea. No one really knows what that means down here, and we're trying to evangelize that a little bit more and advocate for that, and they're supportive of that. Well, as could well. you tell us, please, a little bit what is what does a cooperative? I mean, what is a cooperative? So it's a, in layman's terms. In layman's terms, <laughs> uh, a cooperative. We're a worker-owned cooperative, meaning the employees own the business. Uh, my wife and I, we sold a transaction, sold the business to a, this cooperative group, and we're using the profits of the business to pay for that transaction so the employees themselves do not actually have to uh, cut a check. So do the, um, well, you say you sold the business to a cooperative group. That That's means... A our business. Okay. So we created it's a, it's an L So people had to buy into the business. They they become members. Okay. It's a, for a, for a modest membership fee they become members. <laughs> they can get that membership back. But in general, just at a high level, um, the employees now participate in the governance, the running of the business. They vote. We have a, a a board that is elected by the members and represents the members and they d determine the future and strategy of 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 the business and they share in the profits and losses. The biz of the business, they don't have okay. personal losses, uh, um, but they can have personal gains based on business success. So basically, the work that they put in is directly reflected uh, in profits that they can now uh, take advantage of. Okay, so the work they put in, the attitudes they have, the way they greet the public, and want, wanting to make the, make the public come back and visit again. Yep, our goal is to make people. We, we create happiness. That's all. That's all we do. <laughs> We're completely discretionary. No one has to come in and buy a slice. That's right? a, yeah. That's so, very true. That's so, a, that's a good point. Yeah. And and so everything we do is to make a, a, a. We want you to have an exceptional experience when you come in. Uh, food, service, the whole thing. Visuals and everything. a good attitude. <laughs> good attitude. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, if you had one request of a Silicon Valley government to improve the environment. For small business development and success, what would that be? Uh, my biggest message would be education, in, in, informing, 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 and in, in two ways. First is through the public, um, 
communicating cost of living issues, wage issues, and how that could translate to business price structure changes. And then the second would be around business, educating on what other forms of employee ownership exist to give them uh, to give businesses an understanding and to make them aware that, for example, work cooperatives is an example of a legitimate, structured business that is that is functional. It's a legal entity. It, we work in the LLC uh, realm of of the of the law, and it's a, it's a it's a viable way to be an exit strategy for people that want to get out of the business, or just reward employees that want to be part of the business. So, how would they go about educating? Uh, through um, seminars in city council, and the first part is educate the government. Government needs to be educated so they can evangelize to the local community when they get stopped at the supermarket, at the okay. gas station, or things like that. So maybe it's an issue, too, of uh, the city governments learning what the uh, small businesses need. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, and and, and, and part, then educating part of, perhaps what seminars or forums or ma making seminars available online, um, like YouTube's and and videos. We're we're technology area. We should be using technology to the best of our abilities. Well, that, now that's that a available. good point. That's a good point. And You're an old tech guy. I'm so an old tech guy. <laughs> I always want to see how technology. I got into the pizza business saying I'm going to bring technology to an industry right. that is technology deprived. Right. Um, and we've actually developed some software internally that make our business more effective. Okay. Which I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, is uh, are there any clo is there a closing statement or anything you'd like to say in uh, t in uh, final to uh, end our show? We're about out of time here. Well, the, the biggest thing is um, for local for local government or, or or the community in general that anybody that's hearing this would be to whatever changes we see is to focus on the people. Make sure it's an inclusive vision okay. that handles not just the corporations and the high-tech people, uh, but also handles the service industry, teachers, um, and everybody in between. So you have the entire spectrum that are represented. Right now, there are two people that typically are represented in, in, in the community, tech workers mm -hmm. and homeowners, mm -hmm. privileged. And those are the only two voices, and those are not the only two mm -hmm. demographics that live here. And we need to have an inclusive uh, vision for how all of those people that, beyond those uh, people that are have either been here or coming here that make a very high salary, how they can survive in Silicon Valley. Well, thank you for a very interesting discussion. You I enjoyed bet. talking with you. Thank you, Chuck. Kirk, thanks for joining us today on The Better Part. Also, I would like to invite our TV viewers to join us and become members of The Better Part. Visitors are always welcome to attend our meetings held at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays at the Cupertino Senior Center. If you are interested in becoming a Better Part member, please contact the Senior Center for more information or simply attend one of our meetings. Remember, too, that our shows are also available for viewing on Roku and YouTube. Thanks for watching. Thank you.